Okay, good evening, colleagues. Welcome to the number 27th Tourism Online Forum series in uh, November 2023. And this series is hosted by the Center for Advanced Tourism Research, CATS, at Hokkaido University. This is your host, Mo. Today, we are very honored to have uh, Dr. Chris McMorgan, Moran, right? Sorry, if I pronounce it right, to share his recent book about Liu Kang, Mobilizing Hospitality in Rural Japan. And Chris Sensei is Associate Professor of Japanese Study at the National University of Singapore. He is a cultural geographer of contemporary Japan, focusing on the geographies of home across scale, from the body to the nation. He is the author of Liu Kang, Mobilizing Hospitality in Rural Japan, uh, and with the University of Hawaii Press. Uh, Ethnography of a Japanese Inn based on 12 months, uh, basically one year spent in uh, scrubbing baths, washing dishes, and making guests, guests feeling at home at Hot Spring Resort. He has also published research on tourism, disasters, genders, labor, gendered labor area studies, field based learning, and the uh, evolution of grading. So please note that this online lecture uh, already been recorded and will upload it to the uh, our center's YouTube channel. Uh, so let's invite Chris Sensei to have uh, his research and lecture. And the Q&A is always available in the chat box. Okay, Chris, you may have the floor. Okay, thank you very much, Mosan. Thank you very much to Katz and everyone at Hokkaido University for inviting me today. It's really my pleasure to talk about my book um, I'm going to uh, share my screen and begin. So, okay, perfect. Uh, okay yeah, thanks. Um, and to everyone watching today, thank you very much for taking your time to join us. And for everyone watching in the future on the YouTube channel in multiple languages, thanks again for uh, your interest in this work, in, in me as a speaker, and um, I hope you use some of the uh, things that you learned today. I mean, I hope it gives you some new insights on the work of hospitality, both in the Ryokan and beyond. Hopefully there are larger lessons to be learned. I have shared my research um, on Ryokan with public and academic audiences in Japan, France, Germany, Sweden, Singapore, the Netherlands, and the UK. Uh, for people who are audience members who have never traveled to Japan, I have always been happy to introduce the unique characteristics of the Ryokan to them. For listeners like yourselves, I mean, I, I assume most people uh, logging into this CATS channel who are listening today um, are maybe based in Hokkaido or based in Japan. And so I hope to uh, be able to share some backstage secrets and personal stories that you might otherwise not experience when you go to a Ryokan. Um, overall, I hope to show the complexities involved in mobilizing hospitality for tourists. That's the subtitle of my book, of course, Mobilizing Hospitality. I'll talk about what that means. Um, okay, for many of you, you might recognize this person. I'm sure many of you recognize her, especially after your recent CATS lecture by Mike Dignan about events like the Olympic Games. Of course, um, this is uh, Christelle Takigawa. In September of 2020, uh, 2013, when uh, media talent Christelle Takigawa made the final pitch for Tokyo's bid to host the 2020 Summer Olympic Games, she claimed that to Tokyo would be a superior host because of its hospitality. In her speech, uh, delivered in French, she memorably taught the audience the Japanese word for hospitality gesturing with each slide and each syllable saying o mo te na shi o mo te na shi many of you may remember this moment in doing so she seemed to suggest that japanese hospitality was both unique and superior to the competitor uh, nations hoping to host or cities hoping to host the olympics and that's a contention that many of us here might uh, uh, might agree with. So yes, Tokyo 2020 was supposed to be the Omotenashi Olympics, with tens of thousands of athletes, officials, and spectators from around the world 
enjoying the games and experiencing Japanese hospitality both in Tokyo and around the country. In fact, in her speech, Christelle Takigawa and the Tokyo Olympic Committee seem to be appealing to more than just the IOC. They also seem to be mobilizing the Japanese population, potential volunteers, corporate sponsors, taxi drivers, people on the street, all of them to embody Japanese hospitality to the world. Now, this mobilization for Tokyo 2020 didn't come out of nowhere. Indeed, it was part of a broader push by the Japanese government that had, began, uh, that had begun years before to increase the number of inbound tourists to 40 million by 2020 and 60 million by 2030. Now, of course, COVID interrupted this progress. We can see that we're already up to around 20 million as of today, I checked the statistics. So Japan is uh, reaching back to some of those pre-COVID numbers. At the same time, of course, opening up the country to foreign tourists does not mean opening it to everyone and not providing that same kind of hospitality to everyone. Because Japan is famous, famously or infamously in the last, uh, you know, for, for, for a long time, refused to open the doors to refugees, asylum seekers, and most migrants, except in very temporary conditions. In other words, this omotenashi moment of the Tokyo uh, 2020 games highlighted what tourism scholars, political geographers, and others recognize as the contentious geopolitics of hosting, in which both the cultural power and possibilities of hospitality and the social and political limitations of hospitality sit side by side, often pulling in op opposite directions. Today, I want to focus on the complexities and experience of Japanese hospitality, not through the topic of global sporting events or asylum deniers, although these are very important topics, but through a particular space, the ryokan, or traditional Japanese inn. I'm going to talk about the microgeographies of this location that for many owners and employees is both public and private, home and workplace. And I want to introduce some of the lives that intersect in that unique business. In doing so, I provide an on the ground perspective of the geographies of home at various scales, the geographies of mobility and immobility, <clears throat> and the ways that gendered labor intersects with these geographies in the Ryokan. So, as I was saying, many of you in the audience know what a Ryokan is. Uh, but you also, of course, know that Ryokan can come in many shapes and sizes, from a five-room inn in the heart of a city or deep in the mountainside, or Ryokan hotels with hundreds of uh, rooms in seaside resorts like Atami or Beppu. Government agencies, trade associations, and travel agencies often translate Ryokan as traditional Japanese inn a term that highlights the commodification of design, food, and cultural practices as specifically Japanese. And the size seems to matter less than the aesthetic and the form of hospitality. So of course, ryokan are distinct from hotels in their baths, their architecture, their interior design, their food, and their hospitality. And this is a distinction that matters to both hosts and guests, both domestic and foreign. I cannot express how many times when I was working in a ryokan, um, my guests, both Japanese and non-Japanese, um, praised or went out of their way to explain that they had come to this place specifically in order to experience some kind of authentic Japanese hospitality by staying in a traditional Japanese inn. Ryokan are also distinct from hotels in the structuring of time. Um, I'll give you a moment to look at the Ryokan day for both guests <clears throat> and for hosts. And I've separated out here the female nakai, the women who typically serve wel welcome guests and serve meals and then clean the rooms when guests leave. I've separated out their work in yellow a highlight uh, in green highlight are the male drivers and landscapers or gardeners who do a lot of the everyday work of cleaning baths and 
and scrub um, uh, sweeping paths and they help with parking cars and, th and things like that. And then of course there's the, the combination of them uh, that a lot of times when it comes to tidying futons in the evening uh, or during breakfast or in the evening after dinner, Sometimes those will be Nakai, some of the times those will be the men who kind of are doing everything around the inns. As you can see, the typical guest stays only one night. And since dinner and breakfast are included, they tend to spend more time within Ryokan space and in the presence of Ryokan staff than the typical hotel guest, right? I'm still pointing out this distinction between a hotel and a Ryokan. Importantly, this extends and heightens the possibilities for what I call embodied hospitality. I mean, literally, the staff of Ryokan are just in the presence of guests far many more hours and, and more time than, than guests are in, in the presence of hosts in a hotel. Usually in a hotel, you just check in and then they kind of leave you alone for the rest of the time. That's very different in most Ryokan. Ryokan are the preferred accommodation for many Japanese guests. A lot of people insist on a 60th birthday being celebrated at a Ryokan or a, a, a wedding anniversary, other, other kinds of uh, events like that. And a Ryokan is a must try for many non-Japanese visitors. <clears throat> Even though Ryokan often costs two to three times more night uh, than most hotels. This is another thing that many of my non-Japanese uh, guests would often, you know, re remark on, saying that it, it was worth it, even though the Ryokan was so expensive compared to their the rest of their trip. You know, a typical guests would be on a ten-day trip around Japan, and they would only spare one night for a Ryokan because that's all they wanted to afford. Now, despite their continued popularity, Ryokan numbers have been declining for decades, even as um, the number of hotel rooms and hotels themselves have grown to accommodate the rising number of foreign visitors. Now, um, you can see some of the declines in these numbers. The latest uh, report I saw from 2019 uh, talked about the number of inns dropping to 38,000. I, I imagine that during COVID, the numbers dropped even further with some families uh, finally uh, giving in and giving up. At the same time during this time period, the number of hotels has increased and this number has gone up as well. Uh, anyone who's walked around uh, downtown uh, major cities in Japan knows that the, the number of small business hotels has boomed in recent years. So for the past two decades, I've been researching Ryokan in and around Kurokawa Onsen, uh, shown here in the map on the right. Uh, the tiny box, uh, the tiny gray box in the kind of upper right hand corner here <clears throat> is the inset uh, of all of this area and Kurokawa you see in the kind of center middle with the vertical stripes indicating the larger town of Minami Oguni uh, of which Kurokawa is just one of the many um, small um, hamlets. So Kurokawa Onsen <clears throat> I've been visiting since uh, 2001. I've been um, I've been studying how the inns in Kurokawa mobilize hospitality to make guests feel at home, and a long way, along the way, how they maintain their remote community in an area when so many similar rural communities suffer. Part of this success has been attributed to Kurokawa's nostalgic landscape, which appeals to guests longing for a Japanese hometown or furusato. This is the subject of chapter two of my book. And it is really a beautiful landscape. And I've been fortunate to live there for, uh, uh, you know, around a year and to go and visit for so many times I can't count on any, any given hand. Um, and I first went to Kurokawa in 1995 or 1996 as a tourist. And I went back again this last, um, uh, once last, uh, last year, which year, which month was that? Maybe in May. Uh, so I keep going back again and again. I never get tired of it. <laughs> <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> so that's the landscape, and it's been very important. But today I want to step through that landscape, and I want to step inside the Ryokan itself to share my research on Ryokan work. Now, this work has included ethnographic research in 2006 and 2007, when I scrubbed bags 
washed dishes, swept pads, vacuumed tummy mats, <coughs> pardon me, carried luggage and laid out bedding, all work that owners hoped would make, feel, uh, make their guests feel at home. I spent most of my time at a single inn, which I've called Yama Zakura. Um, that's the pseudonym that I've used for the main inn of, of my work. <coughs> I also worked at um, other ryokan in Kurokawa and nearby onsen like Tsuetate Onsen in order to talk to other employees and compare the work. Along the way, I informed everyone that I worked with about my position as a researcher and my aims. I was a PhD student researching the forms and meanings of Ryokan work, and I received permission from inn owners to conduct that research. Now, at the outset of my research, I really worried that my coworkers would hesitate to talk to me or to welcome me, uh, especially since I had received permission through their bosses, right? I might be seen as a kind of agent of bosses. I found instead that my coworkers were thrilled to have me. It could have been because I arrived right at the beginning of August, right at the onset of Obon season, and they really needed the extra hand. But later on, I also learned that some of my colleagues were happy to welcome me because they hoped I might be a useful tool to communicate their own grievances back to management. They were too hesitant to do so themselves, but they thought the foreign researcher might actually have the ear of the boss and might not hesitate to do so. I had very little to lose. I talk about that sensitive subject um, in chapter six of my book. Since my, <coughs> <coughs> pardon. Since my field work ended in 2006, I've returned to Kurokawa nearly every year, sometimes with students, and I've kept in touch with uh, some ryokan owners and with employees through social networking sites and through physical meetups, both in Japan on a regular basis, and even in Singapore, several of the owners of uh, Kurokawa's inns came to visit me and uh, my students at the National University of Singapore several years ago. All along, I've been interested in the Ryokan's daily, seasonal, and generational work. I want to know who does that work and what does it mean for both the family business owners and their employees? And that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, both in the book and today. So most ryokan are family businesses run by a married couple. They work together to keep the business running smoothly, but they play different roles and perform different tasks embedded in Japan's gender division of labor. He is shacho, a gender neutral term for a company president. She is called okami, a gender specific term that can be used for a wife or a female business manager, like in a bar or a restaurant. In general, Shacho is responsible for men's work, otoko no shikote, work considered more masculine due to its location and or its need for special tool, tools or skills. This often includes work on the uh, work on the inn's exterior, like landscaping and building maintenance. But it also involves work done outside the inn, like attending meetings of the local Ryokan Owners Guild and doing political work. Okami is responsible for women's work, ona no chugoto. This includes welcoming guests, serving meals, cleaning rooms, and managing the finances of both the family and the business. Now, very importantly, she is there. She is the woman who is behind the counter at check-in and check-out and she is around the ryokan more than her husband. I cannot tell you how many times I visited inns and I could always find Kami-san, she's always there. And if I wanted to meet with Shacho-san, he was always gone. Not always, but frequently gone and more difficult to track down. In this way, the Okami resembles the ideal Japanese housewife who is responsible for the care work that occurs at home and who embodies the home through her presence. Now, national surveys in Japan often re reveal gaping disparities between men and women in the time that they spend on household chores and childcare. I'm sure most of you in the audience have seen some of these statistics. Now, even for women who work full-time jobs outside the home, they also they all tend to be also tend to be responsible for 
most of the work in the household. This therefore or further reinforces the divide between what's considered men's work and women's work. The ryokan is uh, often a family business that doubles as the owner's family home and relies on feminized care work. So it should come as no surprise that Japan's spatial and gender division of labor is commonly found in the ryokan. And I can attest personally to the fact that Okami and other ryokan staff police this divide. What I mean by that is they are always reminding people of what is a woman's job and what is a man's job. So from the start of my research, my novelty to both my bosses and coworkers was not just my interest in the interior work and the interior lives of Okami and Nakai, those are the women who serve uh, who welcome guests and serve tea and then serve dinner. But my, uh, my novelty was also my willingness to do women's work. My willingness to run the vacuum cleaner, wipe a mirror, or wash towels was frequently met with surprise, particularly in the early months. And when I did it well, my coworkers sometimes congratulated themselves on training a man. Now, one afternoon, several months into my research, I entered the dining room with a load of towels straight from the dryer. I had been in charge of laundry that day. As I placed them on the floor and began folding them with a handful of my coworkers, one of the Nakai laughed and suddenly exclaimed that I would make a wonderful wife. I mean, I laughed and everyone else laughed. I thought it was quite funny and I'm sure she meant it as a compliment, but she was clearly policing the boundaries of work that is appropriate for men and for women. <clears throat> now, beyond the everyday labor of hospitality and being there, the Okami's interior work also involves caring for the family of the family business. She is the wife, the daughter, or more frequently the daughter-in-law <coughs> of the previous owners. And ideally, she needs to be mother of a successor. In fact, biological and social reproduction is every Okami's most literal and vital inside job. Once she has a child, she must train her replacement. Indeed, excellent service and a beautiful landscape may bring profits, but there's no real success without a successor. During my field work, I interviewed over a dozen okami, and I chatted informally with half a dozen more. Here, I turn to the story of Kubo-san, an okami who helps me highlight several key elements of ryokan work. First, there are multiple fr <coughs> sorry, there are multiple time frames of ryokan work. Here, I mean that the ryokan work involved includes both the immediate work, that is the right now emotional, immediate moments of a smile or a gesture shared between a guest and a host. That's, in, that's immediate work. But it also includes the generational work, the long-term family creation and community building work that keeps a family business intact for years. Both time frames of work sustain the ryokan and the larger community of Kurokawa Onsen, and both time frames of work are vital to understanding the ryokan. But it's often only the immediate work that is seen by most tourists and most visitors. The longer I spent behind the scenes, the more I could see that other generational work happening uh, behind us. Second, I want to highlight Kubo's story, I'll, I'll tell it in a moment, uh, because it shows how Kurokawa Onsen's success has shifted the burden of the immediate embodied labor away from okami and toward non-family employees who are the focus of the second part of today's talk and the second part of my book so what i'm trying to point out here is i'm going to tell a short story about kubo-san and in doing so <coughs> pardon me and in do, doing so i want to highlight both this this different time frames of work but also how a lot of the immediate work has shifted to uh, away from the body of the okami and the family of the family business and towards non-family employees. And this is quite um, common in very busy uh, tourist ryokan around Japan.
So Kubo-san grew up in a farming family in a village near Kurokawa. As a child, she watched her mother toil in the fields and at home, planting rice, cutting weeds, harvesting crops, raising children, cooking, cleaning, sewing, etc., etc. It was like two full-time jobs. So when the eldest son of a souvenir shop owner in Kurokawa proposed marriage at the age of 22, Kubo-san jumped at the chance. She imagined she could escape. <coughs> she could escape to a more leisurely life as the okami of a gift shop. <coughs> now, a few months before the wedding, his parents purchased a ryokan. This is a quote now. She said, I knew a little about Kurokawa Onsen, she admitted to me one, late one night in her inn's empty dining room. But I didn't know anything about Ryokan work. Her fiancé assured her that wouldn't be a problem. He told me, you can sit around all day. That's what she said to me. I looked up from my notes and chuckled at the idea of an idle okami, especially a new bride. But she wasn't smiling. The opposite happened. He sat around while I worked under the watchful eye of her new mother-in-law. Now, Kubo-san uh, Kubo should not have been surprised. A new bride who moves in with her in-laws has long been a pitiable fi figure in Japan. She has the lowest status, yet shoulders the greatest burden of caring for her new family and ensuring that there's a successor. She's expected to wake first and sleep last, and she spends most of her days scrutinized by her mother-in-law, a figure that one scholar has called a virtually demonic character in Japanese fiction, folklore, and drama. Kubo needed to learn everything expected of a new wife and future Okami, and she needed to learn it the Kubo way. From the flavor of the miso soup she made each meal, to the way she cleaned the inn or spoke with guests, she was expected to learn the taste or the aji of her new family. Her mother-in-law trained her by criticizing her cooking, her sense of aesthetics, the way she moved in front of guests, her personality, you name it, she criticized it. It was yet another form of interior work for Kubo, a long demoralizing process in which her habits, desires, and tastes were disregarded and dismantled before being slowly built back up again in a way that suited her mother-in-law. In those early days, the inn was only busy on weekends and holidays, so it employed only a few full-time staff. On busy days, Kubo-san hired local women, farmers like herself, to serve the evening meal or to clean rooms. Otherwise, most work fell on her shoulders. Even after giving birth to each of her four daughters, she was expected to quickly return to work. She was on her feet every day, caring for both family and guests, while her mother-in-law looked on from behind the scenes and minded the grandchildren. That was years ago. Today, Kubo's Inn is very busy and quite profitable. In fact, it's profitable enough for her to spare her, to spare her from the physically demanding work that consumed most of her 20s and her 30s. She spends most days doing what she calls backstage work, uro no shigoto, managing her large staff and the inn's finances, writing New Year's cards. She is the human resources manager, hiring and firing employees. And she's the accountant, paying vendors and managing payroll. She's also the face of the inn, greeting guests in the lobby during check-in and check-out, and answering the questions of curious foreign researcher, researchers like me. But her most pressing responsibility is training her replacement, her daughter, a fraught topic that I discuss in the book. Okay. So ryokan owners like Kubo frequently call their business a home, and they refer to their staff as a family. They use these words of ie and kazoku, um, but owners and employees lived in very different worlds with different social and economic circumstances, different obligations, and different futures. In the first half of my book, I explain the national and regional context for Kurokawa's active landscaping of itself into Japan's Furusato. I also discuss the interior care work done by Okami, which includes establishing her unique flavor, 
sorry, her unique flavor of hospitality and doing the generational work associated with succession. But in busy inns like Kubo's, Ryokan owners are not the bodies actually providing hospitality every day to guests. That work falls to a team of specialized employees working both behind the scenes and face to face with guests. So let's shift to the second half of the story. <clears throat> and this is an image drawn for the second half of the book or the, the, the sec, uh, back cover of the book. So the second uh, half of the book focuses on the Ryokan staff. Those are the cooks. Those are people who prepare the staff meals. And that's different from the chefs who prepare the guest meals. These are often different uh, and they're often split down gender lines. So the cooks are women who prepare meals for staff and the chefs are men who have been professionally trained and prepare the meals for guests. And all of this, of course, occurs in the kitchen, which is kind of off limits and unseen for most guests of an inn. So you eat an amazing meal that comes out course by course, but you don't see the hands of the people who are actually serving it to you. This is something that one of my closest friends was a, was a chef, and he, uh, he really wanted to have that face-to-face -face interaction with guests, and he was quite jealous of the nakai because the nakai are the ones who are serving the meal to the guests, and they can see a guest's eyes light up as they see the creativity and the artist artistry of the chefs. Um, one of my th this friend always felt like he was missing out something very, um, very personal and um, special in that <coughs> in that interaction by not seeing the eyes of, his, uh, of the people who would eat his meals. Uh, we also have the front desk staff. Those are often a specialized team of people who are working on check-in and check-out. They're answering the phones, uh, reservations, uh, making bookings months in advance. Then you have drivers, people who are also, uh, uh, they're working to pick up guests from other, uh, from other inns or from the bus stop. Uh, they're also collecting people's luggage in the, the, um, in the parking lot. Uh, they are also, in many smaller inns, the same uh, men who will sweep the paths and put out the umbrellas the day after a rain so that they nice, uh, nicely air out. That's what I'm showing in this image here. They'll maintain the plants and make sure that the landscape itself uh, continues to look be beautiful. And then finally, there's the nakai. And these are the women that I mentioned earlier. These are the women who welcome guests the, at the front desk, guide them to their rooms, explain the ryokan layout and facilities. They often serve a cup of tea, and then later they serve dinner, either in a guest's room or increasingly over the years in a shared dining room. Now, you might wonder who are these women, uh, the nakai, and how do they come to this ryokan work? They are not family members. They are not you know, connected to the family business in any way. <clears throat> Ryokan hospitality, I att attest, is so intimate and time-consuming, so physically and emotionally demanding, that any okami with more than a handful of guests needs to mobilize a specialized labor force that will care for guests in her place. These are a, w a group of women untethered to the space that both defines and devalues her labor. Put simply, the Yokan needs women without a home. Now, I don't mean that they are women who are destitute or homeless per se, but these are women who are without a home filled with people who need their physical and emotional labor every day. After all, if my coworkers were taking care of strangers from early morning until late night, like 9 p.m. or 10 p.m., sometimes later, they could not also be taking care of their husbands, children, parents-in-law, or grandchildren at home. All of my coworkers were free from those kinds of domestic responsibilities, but they were also stuck in a different kind of domestic trap. What one of my coworkers described as uh, doing work that was only domestic labor, what she called a uh, shufu no koto to mataku isho, right? work that I had done that was exactly what I had done as a housewife. It's not really specialized tasks, right? These are 
these are gendered female hospitality tasks that are done uh, to welcome guests in an inn. Nearly all the Nakai I worked with and met around Kurokawa and surrounding uh, 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 onsen in the area were transplants from distant cities and towns who lived in company dormitories or rented apartments in nearby villages. Nearly all of them were divorced, separated, widowed, or unmarried. While each person's story was unique, what they shared was a lack of a home whose family members needed their everyday care. Right? These are women who's, who don't have family members that need them every day. This meant the Nakai had time to care for strangers through the Ryokan's intimate, time-consuming Japanese-style hospitality. At the same time, the Ryokan provided the women a roof over their heads and the opportunity to earn a living, even if they had been out of paid employment for decades. One Nakai put it bluntly, the position of Nakai meant she could finally live without a man. But their freedom made them vulnerable. They were susceptible to the demands of their bosses with no permanent roof over their heads, little job security, and a looming sense that today could be their last. In fact, several co-workers told me that when they, you know, when I asked about their futures, they were always worried that the okami might say, "Ashita konaktei," just don't come in tomorrow, um, which would make an akai jobless and essentially homeless. Plus, the common notion of hospitality as a form of caring labor associated with women, right? This is the very gendered nature nature of that work and its association with this home-like, kind of pseudo-home-like space of the ryokan, heightened my coworkers' vulnerability. Um, indeed, what most of my coworkers actively devalued their labor by insisting that ryokan hospitality could not, and indeed should not, be professionalized. <clears throat> Here, gender norms about care work and hospitality intersect with the cultural geographies of home to undermine the professional working identities of employees with what I consider advanced soft skills. This became clear in a series of professionalization workshops or Kenshu held at Yamazakura in 2006. This is just around the time that I arrived to do my field work. <clears throat> One of the sessions, the professional se uh, professionalization sessions, occurred on a weekday in September at 10 a.m. when we would normally start cleaning guest rooms, right? If you think back to the, the daily schedule, 10 a.m. is when we are supposed to have a short, uh, a short tea break from, 10 th uh, from 9.30 to 10, and then from 10 o'clock we start cleaning because that's checkout, and so the guests should be gone. And the, the building is empty of guests, so we can make as much noise as we need to. So instead of starting this cleaning routine, which we needed to do in order to finish and get, you know, finish in time for lunch and get the place ready for the next group of, of guests, instead of doing that, we were supposed to attend this training session. And uh, we also had to sacrifice our afternoon break and clean our rooms after lunch. So anyway, after washing the breakfast dishes, we prepared the dining room. We arranged three rows of tables to face a single table at the front of the room where our trainer would sit. Furukawa-san, the trainer, began by reminding us of his credentials. He'd worked over 30 years as a quote-unquote hotel man, gradually moving from bellhop, bellhop to manager before starting his own service-focused consulting firm. While he had no experience working in a ryokan, keep your eye on that, um, that didn't seem to matter. He was paid to raise the quality of our hospitality, which to him meant introducing a standardized or hotel-like form of hospitality onto ryokan space. The idea that each ryokan had its own unique flavor or that ryokan were appealing precisely because they featured a more homely form of hospitality, all of that didn't seem to occur to him. So, Next, Furukawa led us in exercises to standardize our greetings. <clears throat> this included making us stand in two lines and practice smiling, reciting key phrases, and bowing to each other. 
In trying to standardize our speech, the individuality of each Nakai, including the regional dialect that some of them had, was slowly being trained away. Furukawa also provided spatial advice, like how to greet a guest in the hallway. Stop, step to one side, and bow slightly as they pass. As well as how to properly approach and open a guest room door. He aimed to standardize how the Nakai used their bodies as hospitality tools. Nakai spent hours each day doing physical and emotional labor. Physical labor like kneeling and standing, carrying heavy trays of food, and cleaning rooms. Emotional labor like welcoming guests with a warm smile and genuine curiosity about their drive to the inn. Or the emotional labor of reading the room during dinner to determine whether their guests want someone to blend into the background or to play along with their jokes, or to tell them about an excellent pizza restaurant located nearby. My coworkers had these skills they had developed over years to kind of understand what their role was and what to do in the presence of guests. In front of guests, <coughs> pardon me, in front of guests, a Nakai could move quietly through the hallways and doorways, careful not to disturb a family argument or the laughter of a college reunion. But when we cleaned guest rooms each morning, we moved differently. We walked quickly and loudly. We slid open doors and closets with a swift and satisfying movement. We threw open the windows to try to get rid of the smell of tobacco. And sometimes we exclaimed loudly enough to attract colleagues when we found a room that was incredibly messy. It felt good to make some noise, to whack a futon in the sunlight and watch the dust rise and blow away. Similarly, when the Nakai returned from their afternoon break each day, they folded towels, organized dinner trays, and filled containers with pickled plums to keep their hands busy, all while chatting about celebrities, local bargains, or recent memorable guests. You can imagine when I arrived in August, a lot of the attention was about the annual summer baseball tournament in Kobe. I mean, every day we could talk about that for hours. Some of my coworkers studied the list of guest names, memorizing them and speculating on their relationships and why they were here. Was this an anniversary? Was this a company trip? Was this an extramarital affair? All, all we had was the name of the guest and the number of men and women. And if there was a child, there would be the age of the child on the, on the list as well. My coworkers gossiped and smoked and told jokes to embarrass me, anything they could do to delay putting on their Nakai smile until absolutely necessary, right? They were conserving their energy. When the call finally came from the front desk, <coughs> sorry, when the call finally came from the front desk, they could be ready in an instant. But it was only by distracting themselves and conserving their energy, conserving their hospitable selves over time that they could welcome guests in the lobby with genuine excitement. I mean, I think we all know this, we can't be on all the time, whether it's for a child or for a guest or for our students or for your best friend. Sometimes we need a break and a, a mental, uh, emotional break. In the tra training session, Furukawa proposed new routines to, to replace these tactics of physical and emotional conservation and release. He passed out a list of questions. For instance, at the start of the day, do you begin with facial warm-ups? How many times a day do you look at yourself in a mirror? Those kind of questions were on this, this piece of paper that we are supposed to carry around with us. He asked if we opened our mouths wide and did pronunciation exercises every day. Then he gave us a list of vocal exercises and tongue twisters that he suggested we keep in our uniforms so we could practice throughout the day in any free moments. In other words, instead of gossip in the pantry between courses, or instead of sneaking a cigarette next to the river, he suggested that the Nakai should practice smiling in the mirror. And they should practice tongue twisters. Furukawa's ultimate purpose seemed to be to suggest a new physical and mental routine that would standardize our hospitality by making us permanently hospitable bodies, sorry, 
permanently hospitable bodies. <clears throat> After the session, several Nakai complained that the Kenshu was a waste of time and money, as you might imagine. Plus, they had more Ryokan work experience than the so-called expert. Remember, he was a hotel man. He had never worked in a Ryokan. Some of their complaints were also geographical or spatial. They suggested that the attitudes, language, and manners, and these ha uh, habits and, and, and ways of moving the body that Furukawa was encouraging, they didn't really belong in the Ryokan. Right? This whole hotel man was trying to standardize or turn into hotel employees the way the Nakai bowed, spoke, and interacted with guests, despite the fact that in the minds of my coworkers, the Ryokan was supposed to feel different from a hotel. Right? Even at the start of my talk today, I talk about how they are distinguished within Japanese law and within Japanese you know, booking systems, and this is what guests want, is something that is very different. It was supposed to be, <coughs> pardon me, the ryokan was supposed to feel more relaxed and more like home and less like a standardized, boring hotel. Now, most of my nakai lived a fine line between job insecurity and security. They knew that as long as the inn remained busy, they were safe. Their job would be safe, right? It was, uh, the inn was frequently shorthanded. It was, Kurokawa Onsen was quite busy, and so this is a, a safe place to work. But they also knew that once their bodies slowed down too much, they could easily be fired. This was the kind of fear hanging over several of my uh, older, you know, in their 60s, uh, my older co-workers who were slowing down and having knee trouble. And they really worried, <coughs> they really worried all the time that at any moment the, the, um, they might drop a tray or they might trip, and this would be enough for the inn owner to just say, uh, konakte, please don't come in tomorrow, and that would be the end of their career. With rare exceptions though, most Nakai did not see professional development as useful to their job security. Instead, they devalued the physical and emotional labor of hospitality by considering it women's work that could not and even should not be professionalized. So in an industry where many business owners believe that all Japanese women are naturally, and they use this word shizenni, naturally capable of the physical and emotional labor of caring for strangers, um, but that the flavor of hospitality should be modeled after a particular woman, professional development seems incapable of helping many Nakai feel more secure as the body and face of Japanese hospitality. Indeed, gender and location specific understandings of Japanese hospitality combine to undermine the potential professionalization of labor and women's career mobility in the Ryokan. So the success of Kurokawa's Ryokan has been sustained by the strong arms, warm smiles, flexible, flexible personalities and vulnerable lives of women like Suzuki, another one of my coworkers, it's a pseudonym, um, but she escaped an abusive husband by working at an inn, right? She had a child that she brought with her uh, to her first ryokan job. She was escaping an abusive husband, really literally in the middle of the night and uh, running away to a, uh, a, a, for her, her first um, onsen job was in Atami onsen and she had just got on an overnight bus and made the trip uh, because she had to get away from this, uh, this husband. And I met several other women, maybe not in such terrible situations, but some of them um, who had left um, husbands because of gambling debts or because of other issues, or in some cases, just incompatibility. I had one coworker uh, who had left her husband because he finally retired from work and he was home too much and she was sick of him. And so she decided to go work on her own for uh, a few years until she felt like going back home. Um, so this is an example of, again, someone who doesn't have the timely responsibility of caring for her husband on an everyday basis. So she can devote that energy to caring for guests. <clears throat> so without the physical and emotional labor of such women, 
busy ryokan around the country would come to a standstill. In my book, I share how my Nakai co-workers ended up in the ryokan industry and what the work meant to them. I found no common path to the ryokan, but most Nakai did not plan to work there. I mean, I had one co-worker who uh, had worked as an accountant in a very large firm uh, around Fukuoka. And at the age of marriage, I mean, when she finally married, uh, all of her co-workers threw her a retirement party and assumed she was leaving. And so she did. Uh, she only came to the work of the Ryokan after years of dissatisfaction in her marriage, eventually moving on to work in, as a caddy at a golf course for some years, and then finally moving into the Ryokan industry. Um, <clears throat> she's incredibly professional and wonderful at her job, but she does feel like she lost an opportunity by quitting that original job that she was so happy as an accountant. And um, now she struggles um, uh, because she felt like she really missed her opportunity to have a full career in one job. So without the responsibilities of home, these women that I worked with, um, they feel both free and stuck. Right? They have more potential mobility than most women in Japan. However, they're trapped in a dead-end job, feeling that they have no professional skills and they have nowhere else to go. Indeed, for many Nakai, much like their bosses, the Ryokan offered a last resort for economic stability, personal fulfillment, and a brighter future. So it's a very uh, problematic, double-sided relationship with the Ryokan that most of my the people that I, I met with had. So that flip side is the Ryokan owners also sometimes felt trapped because they had moved to the you know this very rural area. Uh, some of them they've married into the families. Others grew up in the family, have gone away to Osaka and Tokyo for education and for work and then in their early 30s have been called back to Kurokawa to take over as the next generation owner. Some of them quite hesitantly or reluctantly have returned because they were enjoying themselves and <coughs> you know, really enjoyed living in the city. And suddenly they have to move back to the countryside. And sometimes they have to also come back to the countryside without a partner. And the expectation is they must marry in order to create the next generation owner of an inn. So there's a lot of pressure on some of the younger generation owners as well, as well as, well as their parents to create the next generation. Overall, uh, it's a story of people feeling both uh, motivated to do this incredible everyday work to encounter guests and make them feel at home. <coughs> <coughs> while also having a lot of really severe uh, responsibilities hanging over their shoulders. So I conclude by talking a little bit about the book. Okay, so my book analyzes how Kurokawa Onsen became one of Japan's best known hot springs resorts, despite its remote location and its lack of historical or geographical significance, as the people in the town will tell you. The first half introduces the families who own the ryokan, and do the long-term generational work to keep the resort and the businesses running. This includes a chapter on the landscaping work that has contributed to the Ryokan's, uh, to the resort's success. And another chapter on how that same landscape has become a tool of exclusion in the face of economic threats from outside capital. The latter half of the book focuses on the employees, <clears throat> particularly the Dakai, the women who spend the most time with guests and whose personal circumstances contrast so greatly the lives of their bosses, the Okami, for who they're uh, for whom sorry who they are supposed to be standing in for. What I mean by that is the typical very small ryokan is supposed to have at the front entrance the Okami waiting for you, the Okami taking you to your room and serving you the meal. Often, uh, often with her husband as the chef, is a very small business. Once the inn gets too large, that okami cannot physically welcome and attend to her guests, uh, so she must hire other people. In the past, she would use family members, 
cousins, aunts, other people who would step in and do those, those jobs for her as a replacement for her. But in some of these places, like in Kurokawa, the inns are just simply too busy and the family members, there just aren't enough of them. So they have to hire all this outside work, uh, outside labor. And that's really what I'm focusing on here is the fact that the, a lot of the outside labor are women who <coughs> are particularly vulnerable and lacking the kind of long-term security that the Okami does enjoy. And their two contrasting um, lives exist in the same space, which I th think is very fascinating. Okay, so overall my book highlights the physical and emotional labor at the heart of Japanese hospitality. And I focus on how landscape, family obligations, gender norms, labor exploitation, and more all com combine to create uh, Ryokan's unique omotenashi, or hospitality. To conclude today, my research has taught me to appreciate the complexity and difficulty of hospitality. It is physically and emotionally demanding work that can also be incredibly rewarding, but it takes a community of hospitality to be successful. It requires multiple stakeholders working at multiple geographical scales from tourism bureaucrats to the individual ryokan nakai. Uh, it takes all of these people to truly make guests feel welcome. I hope that you've learned something today about that complexity and that you can better appreciate the work next time you stay at a Ryokan. Thank you very much. And I do deeply apologize for my cough. I've been sick for the last roughly week. Well, uh, thank you, Chris. And uh, I deeply appreciate if you can uh, still join our webinar series and still willing to present during you are, you are catching a bad, very bad cold, obviously. So thank you very much. Now we are going to the interaction session. As usual, I would like to people to leave in your question, Q&A into the chat box. I actually already have somebody raise up your hand for around 30 minutes. If you have any question, uh, please raise up your hand or also leave the question in the chat box below. <clears throat> okay. I will keep waiting a little bit. Meanwhile, yeah. I probably I have a tons of questions as you ah okay we have uh, someone we have some question. Maybe do you want to answer a live? Uh, I'm okay to do that. Hmm. Um, with women's awareness of gender equity in society, how hmm. will the work undertaken by those women continue, and how will hotels respond? It's a great question. Um. This is interesting. So I guess the question is, how might Nakai, uh, with increased awareness of the desire for, the need for gender equity, how might they continue these, uh, how, will they, and how will the work continue, and how will hotels respond? I mean, I, I don't know, uh, I know gender equity is actually one of the sustainable development goals, and I would really love to see how hotels, and Ryokan in particular, are uh, thinking about gender equity with reference to these um, uh, with the sustainable development goals. Now, I could foresee a very um, um, let's see. I can see a Ryokan owner saying, "Oh, we have gender equity because we have the same number of women as men working in our company," because there are often uh, you know, if you have 15 to 20 rooms, you need, a, you know, five to 10 nakai working. And often you only need two or three uh, driver gardeners and two or three chefs. So actually you might even have more women in the workforce than men. Now, the trickier thing is that the nakai is really a dead end job. And I don't know how gender equity deals with temporary work and precarious work and other kinds of, you know, dead end jobs. Uh, is it just about employment or is it about a certain kind of employment? Um, if gender equity is just about numbers of, of people in work, then I, I guess the ryokan industry could say it has gender equity. 
um, how might hotels, or, or uh, in this case, uh, how might Ryokan respond? This has been the, the point of the, the, one of the last chapters of my book and this part I was just talking about, which is about professionalization. It seems clear that for many Ryokan, the way forward is to professionalize their staff. That will help both the Ryokan attract more customers and it will help the employees feel like they are having some kind of career development, right? If they can take some of these skills and use them beyond the Ryokan world, then that would be beneficial to them. I think there'll be some resistance by uh, some ins. I mean, I know there already is, and I, I spoke with some of those people um, during my study. Some of the inn owners really want to push back on any kind of professionalization because they feel so personally um, that they embody the inn, that their style of hospitality embodies the inn, and that they don't want any kind of outsider to determine how they would treat a guest. So they push back against these uh, uh, professionalization workshops. And in that case, I suppose um, hotel employees will be very self-selective. So they will find the inns that have professionalization workshops and they will, the people who want that kind of professionalization will go to those kinds of inns. On the flip side, uh, there are still going to be people who are just desperate employees. Um, there are still going to people, be people who call in the middle of the night and just need, just need a, a, a place. And they will be less selective and they probably won't care uh, about the lack of professionalization. They will happily mold their personalities to suit the needs of the inn owners and won't really care about gender equity. But that's a really deep question. And thanks for asking it. Okay, we have another long one uh, jumping in. So do you want to engage with that one? Oh, yes, sure. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for your question. <clears throat> Let's see, the ethnography, yes, the ethnographic work was really done in 2006 and 2007. So it's certainly, um, it's certainly been a long time. Let's see, are there any differences to the cultural Ryokan dynamics in Ryokan, uh, especially since my, in my recent visit? I would say the, <coughs> pardon me, the biggest change I've noticed in the last 15 years is less, uh, sorry, fewer Ryokan are doing uh, serving dinner in rooms. This is one of the biggest changes. And I think that this has profound implications beyond just convenience. Um, at the time that I did my work, almost all the places, I mean, every inn that I went to, they all served meals in the rooms. And this was supposed to be because of the desire of, this is a kind of um, consumer trend that uh, customers wanted privacy and they wanted to share only this intimate space with themselves. And so uh, this was one of the reasons why I was told frequently by in owners and and uh, in Okami, why most um, I mean Nakai almost exclusively were female, because no customers wanted a man coming into their room and serving meals. So of course this automatically uh, implicated or or uh, suggested who could be a Nakai and who could do these these jobs. Now in the 10, 15 years since I've traveled both to Kurokawa and stayed there multiple times. And as I keep going back, I notice that more and more of the inns have remodeled and they have taken out or taken away or, or made it more exclusive to have meals served in the rooms. And more meals are being served in shared large dining areas. There are usually partitions for privacy between the different guests, but it's a, it's a re-shifting of, of space. And because of that reshifting of space, you can also now have men serving the meals at the in those large dining rooms because it is less it is seen as less of a gendered space because it's more like a, pro, pro, a public dining room where where uh, the entrance of a man suddenly isn't um, 
invading anyone's privacy. I, I don't know if that's I'm making perfect sense, but this is something that, that's quite large that I've seen. As far as something more on the ground is um, I have had some conversations with some of the inn owners. And uh, in fact, one of the inn owners saw me give this talk or a version of this talk about a year and a half ago. And later we met uh, in person when I, I visited Japan. And she said that for the most part, the older generation of women who are divorced and separated and running away from husbands, basically, she said there are fewer and fewer of those women uh, in the inns in Kurokawa. Now, I don't know how widespread that is around Japan, but she was basically saying that there has been a general professionalization moving up of uh, employees in Kurokawa and some of those um, older women who were just desperate to have any job were no longer qualified. And instead, a lot more women were a lot more young men and women were being hired from specialized training institutes, uh, you know, hospitality schools um, from from around Japan. So that might speak to the professionalization also of uh, ryokan hospitality. Uh, let's see, I think that's the first part of your question. The second part of your question says, uh, after further increased tourism, the, the, the other events such as corona oh coronavirus of course <clears throat> really had a great impact on um on on uh ryokan around the country and uh there were all kinds of measures you know plastic and other things put in right away to try to to keep um keep infections at bay um when I went back as recently in May of this year, all, all of those kind of those COVID infrastructures have been removed for the most part. And in some cases, there are some some uh, remnants still around, but for the most part, those things are gone. Uh, I don't know if we'll see any of those come back or I mean, I think people are happy to have them gone. Um, but that was the, that, that's the main thing is that they were just uh, trying to adjust to those conditions. OK, OK. Let's go to uh, your question number two. For my recent visits, visits to uh, Ryokan in rural areas of Japan, I found out there are a significant increase in foreign workers working as Nakai or doing other jobs. Yes. Okay. This is also uh, something that I noticed in my time going back with students uh, frequently year after year since 2011. I started my first field studies in Japan program. And yes, it's true that the other thing that is has really changed over time is uh, more uh, native Chinese speakers and more um, uh, non basically more non native Japanese um, or non Japanese uh, working in Ryokan. Now, some of them are working behind front desks. Some of them are working as nakai serving meals. Some of those are to to cater to the increase in the number of, of uh, travelers from places like Hong Kong and Taiwan and Southeast Asia, including Singapore, um, and uh, places like Thailand and Vietnam. I mean, the number of uh, non-Japanese visitors has also increased incredibly in a place like Kurokawa. So yeah, that's significant. And this kind of links back to this bigger question of, um, this is something I hint at in the, in the conclusion of my book, is <clears throat> while I was there, so much about Japanese hospitality was presented to me as the non-Japanese uh, hospitality provider as something that was natural, something that came to women naturally. These behaviors and attitudes and patterns and, and language, all of this stuff could not be trained. That's what they almost said, was that this stuff just naturally happened. And so there will be a question now, if there are a lot of non-Japanese uh, purveyors of hospitality in these spaces, will guests always think that the non-Japanese person is not quite Japanese enough? Or will there be a recognition, recognition of these attitudes and, and behaviors and patterns of movement as something that can be learned and therefore can be learned by anyone regardless of gender or, or nationality or uh, background? Um, if that's the case, then I think that is, it helps us shift away from a kind of assumption about certain work being 
only for women or only for men or naturally for Japanese women. And it helps to recognize it and kind of put it up on a, on a pedestal as something that could be seen as world-class hospitality, not something that is inherent to or natural to Japanese women, but that, but that is a, you know, something that can be learned by anyone and perfected over time if you have the right attitude and the right, uh, and the right behavior. So I hope that this increase of uh, more non-Japanese into these roles will help increase the, appear, uh, the, the acknowledgement of Japanese hospitality as something that is truly world-class and can be learned and studied and not something that is just natural. I hope that makes sense. Okay, thank you so much, Chris. Also, thank you, Andrew, for this question. Actually, I want to ask the, the similar question about the question too. Uh, if there is any other question, uh, please <coughs> raise up your hand, also leave your comments below. Uh, I'll just add one, one more thing, sorry, because yes, yes, Andrew please. also asks about, you know, hmm. uh, an aging, aging uh, society and a, and a you know, low, low birth uh, aging society. Uh, yeah, the other thing to think about is in the, in the very distant future, 30 or 40 or 50 years down the line, will today's 30 or 40 or 50 year olds of Japan still see the Ryokan as the natural space to go have, you know, to celebrate um, Kandaki and, and things like this? I, I don't really know. I mean, what will be the cultural place of uh, the Ryokan in the future? Will it be... Um, seen as a kind of uh, a backwards uh, old tradition that no one's no one cares about anymore or will it become kind of more heightened uh, as something that is truly unique within the global hospitality community um, i will say that one of the chapters of my book talks more about the the um the pressures on the next generation of in owners and some of this has to do with these uh, population pressures of having uh, fewer, uh, I mean, of um, uh, general rural depopulation and the fact that a lot of young women don't want to necessarily marry young men who live, live in these kind of uh, rural areas. So there's a real geographical element to this where a Ryokan owner is really trapped in geograph, you know, tra trapped in space in a way that the owner of other businesses might not be, or just a standard salary man might not be. And so the implications on that are quite um, uh, heavy. Um, and I've told some of the stories in my book about young men who have trouble, and even young women who have trouble finding partners to help them take over the business and become the next generation owners. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, I have a question just following Andrew's question. Also, I really, uh, first, your research diagram is really interesting, geographic of home or geographic of mobility and labor. So where is the community laying into this kind of a, a three dimension? I would like to know that. Where is the community? Mm. Um, let's see. I know that the focus on cats is community. So that's a, I, oh, I yeah. should have been prepared for a community <laughs> question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that, um, okay, this in a way gets back to something I was just mentioning is that when we talk about the geographies of home, mm. uh, the geographies of immobility or mobility and the geographies of gendered labor in mm. a place as unique or specific as the Ryokan, um, I think that the community is that it cannot just be seen as the single workplace or that place. Hmm. It is that range of stakeholders all the way, you know, surrounding this small business from the local producers of uh, vegetables and, and meat that is served on the tray. I mean, oftentimes um, it's one of the highlights of the meal is to hmm. talk about the local chicken or the local uh, tofu that was made by, you know, someone in the community. Um, when it comes to this kind of, yeah, these, these spaces of hospitality are often supported by a wider economic and social community. Um, and those are all coming together here. Um, 
you know, thinking theoretically about the intersections of geographies of home, immobility, mobility, and gendered labor, where is the community? I mean, I think because home tends to be a very geographically specific place and some people can get trapped in a home or trapped in domestic labor, I think there's some, um, some, well, I don't really have a, a clear articulate way of saying this, but, um, but I think in the stories that I talk about in my book, um, I have in the past used words like trapped. And one of the young owners of an inn in Kurokawa said, she never feels trapped because she is um, empowered by this uh, responsibility to mm -hmm. reproduce the home, to reproduce the wonderful hospitality of the you know, generations before her. And uh, that is then supported by that wider, you know, it's kind of pushing her to go talk to the people in her community to help um, create a wider scale of what home is. So mm -hmm. she never feels immobilized by that. In fact, she feels mobilized that, by, that, that, by that. She has a geographies of, of mobility where it, uh, it helps her see herself and her community and her, her inn far beyond the narrow boundaries of that building and the boundaries of this small village. Um, her, you know, she is then in that, that thinking about thinking about gender labor, she feels like she is that physical embodiment of that, um, of that sense of hospitality and that, you know, drawing linkages between her in and the wider community and the larger, you know, national geograph uh, national scale of the, of, of the ryokan, um, because she's embodying Japanese hospitality and not just local hospitality. So mm -hmm. there's some kind of intersection of those things. Wonderful uh, explanation. Yeah, thank you very much. I really, I think this point is very important. Uh, probably one last question, if no other people will introduce this opportunity. I'm really impressed the data how many local is declining and how, how many hotels is increasing. So from sustainability perspective, or even, I don't know if any cases are more regenerative approach. So Leokang, do you consider Leokang is more sustainable in terms of uh, for the regional society instead of hotels? Well, uh, I mean, it depends on the Leokang, of course. There could be a new Leokang that is built somewhere in a very unsustainable manner. Mm -hmm. uh, the the Ryokan that I know and the ones that I know most about are older. You know, they've been around for generations. Mm. So they are, I mean, sustainability I, I, is, you know, of course, a very problematic word and not very clear what it means. But, but um, as opposed to any kind of a new build, anytime you can reuse something again and again, I think, of course, that's more sustainable. The problem mm. with many cheap business hotels is the mater materials will not last very long. A lot mm. of it will have to be remodeled and re refinished uh, quite frequently, as mm. opposed to a ryokan, which ages beautifully with time. And with the exception of natural disasters mm. or major renovations desired by the next generation of owner, uh, these inns can be around for hundreds of years. Uh, so, I mean, that can certainly be seen as more sustainable. Mm. Um, I will say, though, and this is something that's not very clear or not obvious, is um, any of these small villages that have Ryokan, um, you see the inn, but you don't see the wider footprint of the inn in the community. And what I mean by that is, uh, each inn has to have, I mean, if it's busy, it needs also to have a uh, dormitory nearby somewhere. And these are often hidden off in a hillside uh, on what used to be right. a rice paddy. Mm. Uh, now it's turned into, you know, very tiny, narrow, uh, single room uh, dormitories that, that are not very well built and probably poor, you know, poor. they might be quite efficient for the use of people in space, but Mm. There's nothing long term or sustainable about them uh, in the same way as the inn itself. So I don't think we want to just look at an old inn and say, well, this is a perfect example of 
uh, sustainable architecture or sustainable business because there's kind of, um, mm. there are spillover effects of these buildings that we are kind of unaware of because they're hidden in the landscape. Yeah, because one thing I noticed also Andrew mentioned uh, one time in, in some onsen in Shimane, in the evening, I meet a Japanese woman mm. to serve us, but you know, normally they have the next morning breakfast. Mm. And suddenly, uh, a pe non-Japanese people <laughs> do exactly the same thing. So mm. that's very common. You see a lot of labors in accommodation in general, not mm. only in local, but also mm. in hotel, especially in major tourism destinations. So uh, that's very interesting. You see how this labor market is changing. And, and I'm wondering, uh, especially in rural uh, locations, is that really easy to find a community member to be part of it or young people basically do not willing to take this kind of job anymore? It, it depends on, well, it depends on the job. So if it's the right. job of taking over the business as the next generation owner, it's fairly right. easy if it's a successful uh -huh. business. If it's not a successful business, some families will choose to not place that pressure on their kids mm. and just say, if they can make a living and survive well elsewhere, don't come back and we can just close the business. <clears throat> that's just, uh, that's a possibility. Right. Um, the other question is, you know, as far as um, people coming to work there, non-family members, this is why probably uh, I mean, there are probably two major reasons why more non-Japanese people are doing these jobs. Number one, the number of non-Japanese guests has increased, and uh -huh. therefore the needs, the language needs, and other things have, have increased. But at the same time, there's been fewer or maybe a decrease of Japanese people who want to do these jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, they are very long hours. Uh, they are really hard jobs. I mean, they're very difficult. Uh, I can attest to that. And... Um, and there are young people who I knew who stayed maybe three months and then just said, oh, it's just too, it's just too hard. I just don't want to do it any, any longer. And this is, you know, 15, 16 years ago. So um, maybe there are some people who want to take the challenge and other people who hmm. try the job and find out it's really not for them. Uh, I mean, as anyone knows, I mean, this is a tourism, um, tourism series. So people who know the tourism industry know that while the hospitality may be fantastic, sometimes the tourists themselves are mm. not so wonderful. I mean, you can have some very demanding and quite um, uh, mean-spirited uh, guests, and it can really take the enjoyment out of the, out of the work for you. Uh, right. If you get insulted or harassed or mm. um, yelled at uh, too many times, and right. I, I was personally yelled at uh, for not doing anything wrong, but just for being in the way or not walking fast enough to help take mm. a photograph of a, a family or something like that. And right. it, can be, it can be demeaning if the guests don't see you as someone who deserves their respect. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. I have other questions related to gender, but I will keep it later. Uh, our Q&A box is queuing up again. So Professor oh. Johan is willing to ask from the perspective of foundational ph uh, philosophical perspective, would you see the differences between the hospitality and omotenashi lines in the different uh, differences between the Western emphasis on right uh, versus the Eastern emphasize on obligations, especially mm -hmm. so with the acceptance of doing jobs without a distinct work safety. <coughs> mm. Gosh, Johan. <coughs> Sorry, take a breath. Um, that's a really interesting uh, question. I haven't put, I haven't heard it put this, this way. So I, I think this might be something I have to think about. Mm. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, you know, omotenashi, yeah, the difference between rights. But I, I guess the question is, hospitality is the rights of, of who? Um, I mean, in the classic sense, hospitality was supposed to be offered to anyone, a stranger. Was that a right? Or was that also an obligation, even in the Western mind? Uh, was that an obligation of, I mean, I'm thinking back to, for instance, I, I last year walked along part of the Camino de Santiago. And I don't think that pilgrims, 
thousand years ago thought they had rights. They didn't imagine they had rights to water or food or a bed, you know, a place to sleep on a night towards their religious destination. Instead, it was the obligation of people to offer, of, of people along the way to offer hospitality to, to, um, to pilgrims. So I'm not sure, I guess I'm not sure, I would have to have a longer conversation with you about the, the origins of this question and whether there's a distinction between this uh, uh, Western and Eastern thought. Um, yeah, good question, I guess. Um, yes, the anonymous attendee <coughs> says the ethnography was focused on Kurokawa. I explored mostly the geographies of home context of family home ryokan if the omotenashi of the ryokan can be performed in a more professional context uh, would that affect the homeliness or authenticity of, of hospitality in ryokan so it, it's a great question and the question is whether it's you're asking me or if you're asking me to reflect on what the people i i interacted with would say if it's the latter i can definitely say yes both the co-workers I was with and the okami that I interviewed, they all worried that professionalization of ryokan hospitality too much would take away some of that homeliness. They were very worried about, uh, you know, staying right on the fence between that authentic um, feeling of home and being professional enough to deal with uh, certain kinds of um, of guests and to give guests what they what they wanted. Um, this, <coughs> pardon me. <clears throat> this was especially the case with. Um, I mean, there there was a lot of uh, there were a lot of women I talked to at this time. I was in my thirties. They were in their fifties, and they had married into the families as the third or fourth generation owner and they felt an obligation to continue giving the same kind of hospitality that their mothers-in-law and previous generations had because they felt an obligation to the future guest or even the regular guest who came every year and expected it to feel the same and what they really i mean there was a lot of talk about repeaters what they really worried about the most was that the inn would become so professional that the repeaters who come back every five years or some so would not recognize the inn anymore and that would alienate them and they would never come back again and they would feel as if oh this okami has really changed things and hasn't respected the past kind of flavor of the inn so definitely this, your, your question is really hits on this where um, that particular inn would worry about the homeliness or authenticity of hospitality at their inn. Now you mentioned the Ryokan managed by this bigger businesses like Hoshino Reser Resorts. I mean, I feel like they are not trying to, uh, Hoshino Resorts, <coughs> You know, within the Ryokan world, there is an audience. There are customers for the Hoshino resorts. And then there are the customers for the, for the, the more traditional family run inns. And I suppose there's some overlap in those, but there are plenty of people that I ran into that they like going to the same inns all the time. I mean, I, I ran into regulars while I was working and they would just say, they don't want to go anywhere else. They don't want to try anywhere else. They just like this form of hospitality. And, and I'll just end on one more thing, because I know we're almost out of time, is um, <coughs> some of my, some of those guests requested specifically certain nakai every time they came back. So they didn't just want to have the same inn and the same general sense of hospitality, but they wanted to be uh, in contact with, I hate to use the word waited on, but they wanted to have the hospitality of the same Nakai year after year after year after year, and usually they would. Um, I mean, a lot. A lot of times, people would take a photograph with that nakai and send her a message afterwards, a letter, often with a, a gift or something else. And then I had several of my uh, coworkers, you know, show me these photographs and talk about these relationships they developed over years with these families. 
And um, that was very important. Uh, and maybe that answers a little bit in uh, earlier Molson's question about com community. Uh, in some cases, in these smaller uh, family run ins, the guests also become part of the community, right? They are people that are coming back again and again, and they have an emotional stake and, a, and I wouldn't say financial stake, but they have an emotional stake in the success of this inn for the foreseeable future. And, you know, the, the owners can count on those people. They know that the numbers of foreign tourists might go up and down and, and, and change, but they can always count on a handful of these repeaters who will keep coming back every year for their same, you know, wedding anniversaries and, and birthday celebrations. And those are part of the wider community of the inn. Thanks for the question. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, probably the last question from me, uh, because I, I supervise a, a female Japanese student, a master degree about this topic. So she is uh, also focusing on a local female group. I'm not sure this group is employee or entrepreneur. So, mm. so she, her conclusion is basically employing more women in Kurokawa Onsen, basically associate the image of woman uh, kind of employment group with the identity of Kurokawa Onsen. But I'm not sure, probably you are in a more critical approach to see this. Basically, from her conclusion, she mentioned about the leadership, education, and the community engagement <coughs> is what they are trying to do. But I don't know from your field work, do you find this kind of uh, activity is really working well? In, uh, well, in, this could be working well, but it could be something that's fa uh, fairly new. I mean, yeah. I will say that there were women's groups while I was there. There's the Okami Kai. So basically, mm -hmm. these are the Okami who meet up on a regular basis and share stories and share in, um, inspiration. And they, mm -hmm. they often will um, invite in a guest speaker. Sometimes it's someone who does a local craft or someone who um, you know, is a, a farmer or so, someone else who does something that might um, interest the uh, women. Mm. There's also a waka okami, waka okami kai. So that's the next generation of okami, whether they're daughters or daughters-in-law, and they would meet as well. And then there was the Seinenbu, the Young Adults or Young People's so Association, which included women, mm. and uh, but was not exclusive to women. But yeah, I suppose there's probably an opportunity for new groups to emerge all of the time mm -hmm. and it could be that there are um in the in the um awareness of greater gender equity <coughs> gender equity in the last um 10 years or more mm -hmm. there could be a push or even a you know self push by young women in kurokawa and and other areas to uh that might maybe they feel like there's an opening for them now mm -hmm to um, to be more active and to learn from each other and to support each other in ways that they didn't before. So that would be, that's very interesting that your student is doing this work and uh, something I'd like to learn more about. Mm, I can send you her graduation thesis in Japanese. Okay, okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, I think we are finished. Uh, oh, there is one more uh -huh. question, You're kidding me. Okay, okay, uh -huh. another question to follow up on my previous question. Uh -huh. I agree on your reflection that pure hospitality in the way right. uh, Derrida described is also an obligation, but com uh, commercial hospitality is often tied up with the idea of service. The word service comes from the Latin word. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce now. Uh, it is, in other words, in other words yeah. a slave. Yeah. It is a challenge as it, uh, as it then gives this assumption of rights that both uh, guests and staff have rather than the obligation of respecting one another. Yeah. Okay, I think it's very okay. wonderful. Thanks, thanks for the uh, follow-up. Hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I have to say, uh, Johan, this, yeah, this is great. Um, I, um, my, my book, I really intended for uh, a both academic and general audience. I really want people who have been to Ryokan ever <laughs> to pick it up and, and, and want to know what's going on behind the scenes, they can enjoy it. Uh, they can also enjoy it if they are, you know, specialists on Japan and they want to learn a little bit more about the specific uh, uh, political and cultural history of this really neat little little village. Uh, people interested in, you know, rural, rural issues, uh, de depopulation issues and things like that. 
Uh, what I didn't do is get deep into the weeds of philosophy of the theory of hospitality. I mean, I know you, you've mentioned Derrida and, um, oh gosh, I'm going to remember her. I'm going to forget her name now. This, is it Judith Butler? Other people have been writing about hospitality uh, in for a while and have really gotten into this and uh, in, um, into this, you know, fascinating um, topic. And I have... Uh, oh, yes, of course, Arlie Hochschild. Yeah, I've uh, read her work as well. And I, I talk a little bit about that um, <clears throat> um, in, in the early part of, the, of my book. But yes, there's, uh, there is uh, not a lot of reflection, deep philosophical re reflection on the topic in the book. So uh, if you want to have a question about that or discussion about that later through email, I would love that. But it, you won't find it in my book. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. I think it's right on time. And thank you again for giving this wonderful lecture. We have uh, endless Q&A. So I have to stop it. You need a break and you need to drink a lot of water and get yeah. rest well. And uh, maybe maybe we will continue invite you to see the update, how this research developed. And okay. also really looking forward to meet you in person. Please visit uh, Hokkaido and Sapporo again and also visit Hokkaido University. And uh, okay. I don't know what time is in Singapore now. Uh, please have a wonderful dinner. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I owe you a beer. So, okay, thank you very much, everybody. I will close tonight's session and thanks all the audience. Uh, keep following up this late. Okay, have a great uh, evening and have a great night. Thank you very much. Thank See you, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>